What's the problem with accepting the resurrection in our world today, I wonder? What seems to be the trouble with what's, what's, the, uh, what's the adversity that we get when we talk about the resurrection? You know, I see a lot of people wearing crosses around their neck, but I don't see many people wearing empty tombs around their neck. Uh, have you noticed that? Um, but you know, 1 Timothy 1.10, or 2 Timothy 1.10 says, Christ Jesus had destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In the New King, it says, uh, New King James, it says, uh, Jesus Christ, who's abolished death, abolished death, destroyed death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Of all the fears that, that grip the hearts of men and women, uh, the greatest fear is death. And now, some of you may be, have some back taxes that may be uh, almost equal, but... Uh, you know, they, they say that uh, you can't avoid death or, or, or taxes. Uh, but you can avoid taxes a little bit for a while. But when it comes time to die, goodbye. Now, today uh, we, we've learned a lot about, about death because a general learns how to push a button in some office in Washington, D.C., and thousands of miles away a cruise missile goes and, and lands in some place and and uh, destroy stuff. The problem is we've learned how to kill, but we haven't learned how to die. And so when we look at this, we understand that, that what Jesus did for us on a daily basis, when it says he abolished death, he destroyed death, it doesn't seem like that's happened. So what does that mean this, this, is a, this is a wonderful affirmation that Jesus has destroyed that thing called death. There's one big problem with that thought in our minds. If death's been destroyed, somebody forgot to tell the undertakers. Because every day there are funerals. There are people who are going to be put in the ground. Their bodies will be buried People die every day. Cemeteries fill up. They, they build new cemeteries. They find a new plot of ground. There's no end to funeral homes and mortuaries and wakes and, and crying moms and fathers and, and children and, and sisters and brothers. See, we don't see death as God sees death. If you doubt my words, look at any obituary section in, in the newspapers. You'll find people who are not alive anymore. One day in Kansas City, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, just one day, there were 37 listings. I, I went online and found this. A 91-year-old former Girl Scout leader, a man who made his fortune on the farm supply business. There was a veteran of the Korean War, a college student who died of kidney cancer, a 17-year-old boy who attended a Bible college who was killed in a car wreck. Death is out there. It is on every hand. And yet the Bible says there in our scripture today, Jesus abolished death. There were 14 obituaries this past few days in Branson, in this little town of Branson, 14. So what, when we read that death has been abolished, and yet it stares us in the face every day, what do we make of all that? It's natural to think about it, because sooner or later, unless Jesus comes back, we're all going to die. Have you come to grips with that? Young people, old people, middle-aged people, they all die until Jesus comes again. So it's easier to not believe than it is to believe in the scripture that we've read a moment ago that Jesus abolished death because it's everywhere all the time. Some people refuse to believe God raises the dead because they've never seen it happen. Well, I haven't either. But I've heard great stories in the last few years about how God in countries in the third world and various places around the globe People are being raised from the dead. And some of you don't believe that, but you've also read the books or seen the movies about, about folks who've gone to heaven and come back and tell you about it, haven't you? So it's possible. Not only is it possible, God sees it as an everyday occurrence, but we don't. We have a tendency to change. You know, you go to the, the cemeteries, I mean, our experience is on the side of unbelief about people being raised from the dead. That's just kind of the way we live our lives. You stroll through the cemeteries, you know, you see all these headstones. They're quiet, they're peaceful, they're serene. Nothing much happens at a cemetery except an occasional funeral. You know, I mean, they come in and they bury someone else. And that's our problem with the idea about resurrection. 
A whole lot of burials, not many resurrections. That's our experience, right? That's the way we look at life itself. That's the way we see things. Now, we've all heard of Doubting Thomas. I mentioned him a moment ago, and I think it's kind of a, it, it's a, a tag that he got, but it's probably not fair. He was a very practical person, this Thomas, this disciple of Jesus, this man who followed Jesus for these years of his life. He wasn't easily convinced, though, of that things would be as they appeared. He wanted proof. He wanted to know for sure. Some might even say he would be a good citizen of Missouri. You know, he was a show me kind of guy. Show me. Don't just tell me, but show me how that works. But let's not be too hard on Thomas because he's really like the rest of us. We're all like that. If I sit here today and said to you, um, you know, Brother Ken Rensink, he passed away. And I'm not, now this is just an analogy, Ken. Don't take, don't be alarmed. <laughs> don't be alarmed. It's okay. Okay, you're okay? So it's just a story I'm telling. It's not real. Anyway, it's a parable. It's a parable. So, so we roll Brother Ken down the middle aisle, and there he is, and he's, he's in the casket, and, and we all come, and we weep over him, and we spend the hour, hour and a half, and we give great commendation to his life, and we talk about him, and, and then at the end, after the songs are sung, and they roll him out and put him in the thing, and we all eat chicken and laugh, and <laughs> after that, <laughs> sorry, Ken. You know, that's what's going to happen. You know that, don't you? You may think, oh, they're going to miss me really badly. Yeah, for about an hour and a half. And then they're going to eat chicken and potato salad, and they're going to talk about other stuff. <laughs> but then, so, so we've had all this thing go on, and it's been a, a big deal. And, and now I walk into McDonald's a couple of days later, and I come back, and I tell the folks in the staff, You'll never guess who I saw at McDonald's. He was eating a, a McMuffin and a hash brown and drinking a cup of coffee. It was Ken Rensink. <laughs> He's happy about that. He's happy. <laughs> you would not believe me, would you? If I said to you, "He's alive. I saw him at McDonald's." You'd go, "You're crazy." It's got to be somebody that looks like him or as crazy like he is or something, you know. <laughs> Couldn't be him. I saw him in a casket. I went to the graveside. I saw them put him in the ground. I saw them dump dirt on that casket. So we're not that much different from Thomas, are we? He had watched. You know, everybody thought he was dead. Think about it. He wasn't just partly dead. He was all dead. I mean, they buried him. Dead people don't just come back to life. Really? Do they? This Thomas was, he was quite a pessimist. He was a champion at that, actually. That's why they called him Doubting Thomas. He saw the dark cloud, didn't see the silver lining. I've known a lot of people like Thomas. Do you know any negative people in your life? Anybody around you that's negative from time to time? You know, the person who brightens up the room by just walking out? <laughs> you know what I mean? That guy. That's that guy. Yeah? <laughs> but but if, if you really back up and take a snapshot of this really tough, difficult moment, after the crucifixion, and they took him down, they wrapped him, they put him in that tomb, they're all cringing now, they're locked, they weren't popular people in their day. In fact, the leaders were trying to kill them all. Now they're hiding away somewhere, they're locked away. So we got to cut Thomas a little slack for this. He, you know, the disciples, they were all gathered in a room uh, and now uh, they're crying, they're, they're, they're discouraged, they're disappointed. What they thought was going to happen, the king that was going to set up the rule in the earth is now dead. Wow. 2 Timothy 1.10, let's read that again. Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Think about that. The one who did this is now in a tomb. Why is death still prevalent? Romans 5.12 tells us. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. 
So death spread to everyone for everyone's end. The cause of death is not cancer, heart attacks, strokes. The cause of death is sin. Sin. But Jesus came to abolish sin as well. And when he abolished sin, he abolished death. So the born-again believer, in an understanding of this concept, sees that when sin is gone, death also is gone. I said to someone this week, I'm never going to die. And they said, well, well, you are. I said, no, I'm not. My body may die, but I'm never going to die. I'm going to be alive forevermore, just like Jesus is, because he gave me life. Amen. Glory to God. That's what it means when we say he abolished death. How can that be? We see it all around us. You know, there's a whole industry, multiplied millions of dollars, an industry designed for your death. Think about it. It's called the life insurance industry. That's kind of a crazy name for it, isn't it? It's actually the death insurance industry. But they wouldn't want to call it that, would they? But you don't get paid till you die. And when you die, you don't get the money. Somebody else does. Is that the craziest thing you've ever heard? It's named wrong. What happens at the end of it? You don't get any of it. And you paid all those years. Somebody else walks away with it and marries somebody else that you didn't ever like in the first place. <laughs> and they got your money. Come on. <laughs> so why buy it? Well, you buy it because you know you're going to die. If you thought you would live forever, you wouldn't buy life insurance, would you? It'd be a silly investment. Wow. We've got it all wrong, folks. We've got it all upside down. We've got it all backwards. So, pause to consider the bare facts surrounding all this. Did Jesus die? Answer that question for me. Did he die? Yes. Was he dead? Yes. Was he completely dead? Yes. Was he buried? Yes. Well, then where's our hope? What can we believe in? If that's all we believed, it's over. There's nothing more. We're going to die and that's it. But there is hope. And our hope is found in what happened on that first Easter morning. The fact that when they went to the tomb, it was empty. They didn't understand it. They're huddled in a room. They're locked away. They're afraid, filled with fear and doubt and discouragement. And then he comes into the room out of nowhere, through the walls, through the locked doors, through the gates. And he says, Shalom, peace be unto you. Wow. Now they're relieved. They recognize his voice. His figure looks a little different, but they know it's him because he begins to recount all the things that they had experienced together, things that only he could have known. Now they're overjoyed. Hope is rekindled, and they're rejoicing together. But where's Thomas? He's not there. Thomas was a, an individual who had to go be alone to get over things. So he was gone. He was not there when Jesus appeared he was sure, just as sure as we would be if someone was lying in that casket and their lifeless, cold body was before us. He had watched them put Jesus on the cross. He had watched him take the last breath. He had heard him say, Tetelestai, it is finished, and his head dropped. He knew he was dead. And now for these people to say, he appeared. He was saying, you're not well in the head. You're seeing what you want to see. You're believing what you want to believe. This is not true. He was just afraid to believe anymore. He was afraid to trust anymore because the one that he had believed in so deeply was now dead. This was all he could think about, all he could see. He said, I don't believe it. I won't believe it until I touch his hands and his feet and thrust my hand into his side. So after that conversation, he cools a little bit in his anger and his disappointment, and now they're eating together, and Jesus appears once again when Thomas is in the room, John 20, 26. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them, and he said, peace be with you. 
Wow. Doors locked. As soon as Thomas heard his voice, he recognized it. It was the same voice that told the wind and the waves to stand still. It was the same voice that said, Lazarus, come forth. It was the same voice that said, by faith you're made whole. It was the same voice that said, you must be born again. He had heard that voice before. I'm here to give you some good news today. There's good news from the graveyard today. There's an empty tomb in the cemetery. Glory to God. There's an empty tomb. That means mine will be empty too one day. Hallelujah. So now, Thomas has changed. His countenance is different. Everything is different. Have you ever, have you ever touched a dead person? You know how cold and clammy they are? You know, I mean, it's just, there's no life there. They're not there any longer. It's, they're gone. It, 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 that's just, it's just old dust. And it will go back to dust. Death, death feels unnatural and terrible. And for me, it's horrible. I mean, to touch someone who's not alive anymore. But we know that that loved one, that person we cared about is not there. Wayne Needham sitting in the back back there. When we were at uh, Margaret's funeral, Wayne, well, you know, if you remember this, I, I turned to you and I said, she's not here. And you already knew that. She's with Jesus. And the same will be true for every one of us who know the Lord. We shouldn't be alarmed at death. Death ain't no big deal when you believe, when you know who He is. No no wonder the Bible calls death the last enemy. Here's what 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, For Christ must reign until He humbles all His enemies beneath His feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Don't be afraid, my friend. Trust in Jesus. One thing I've noticed, and I thought about it a long, long time ago. I heard a story one time, before I tell you that, I heard a story one time about a little boy who couldn't figure death out. He's five years old, and his grandfather passed away, and he had never been to a funeral before. And now here he is, and they're at the graveside, and he's watching uh, shovels of dirt being dropped on Grandpa's casket. And as they covered Grandpa up, he looked up, and he, he said to his mom and to his grandma, he said, how is Grandpa ever going to get out of there? They were able to explain to him that Jesus was going to bring him out and that he could just trust the Lord. You know, one thing I've noticed, there's no latch, I've never seen it anyway, on the inside of the casket. No doorknob in there, you know? Now, some of you might want to add that <laughs> to your, just in case. Might want to add a doorknob. Might want to add a latch inside. It costs you a thousand or two dollars, but you know, I mean, that's what they charge these days for that. But, but there's a latch on the outside. There's a place for a key on the outside. And I know this one thing. When Jesus went to the bowels of the earth and wrestled away from the enemy of God, the keys to death, hell, and the grave, he's got them in his hand. And on the day when he comes, I'm telling you folks, that key will turn and that latch will open and I'm coming out. I don't know about you. I'm going to be with him on that day. That's what Easter's all about. That's what Easter's all about. There's coming a day when the doorknob will be turned, the key will be turned, the latch will be open, and we will come out alive forevermore. Hallelujah. 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 Hmm. So when Jesus appeared in the room, the disciples must have all turned and looked right at Thomas. When Jesus said, peace be unto you, I'm sure they all spun around and said, Thomas, what do you think about that? And Thomas didn't sit there for long, did he? He didn't say, well, let me think about this. Hmm. When he said those words, Thomas instantly changed. And Thomas went from being a skeptic, a negative person, a doubter, filled with fear and some unbelief. Then he said, because Jesus knew his fears, Jesus knew his doubts, Jesus knew what he had said to those other men. But Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus didn't scold him, didn't belittle him, didn't put him down for the words he had said or the things he had thought. He simply said, come, touch me. 
Put your hands in my hand. Feel what I've done. And Thomas said to him in verse 28 of John 20, my Lord, and my God, I don't have to touch you. I don't have to, I don't have to come and hug you. I'm just going to fall on my knees and worship you. And in one swift moment, and this can happen for you folks, all the anger, all the disappointment, all the doubt, all the fear, all the difficult moments were swept away by simply realizing that Jesus is the risen Lord. By simply realizing that his hands and his feet were pierced, that his side was riven, and believing then after seeing. I hope I've drawn a picture where you can see this today. But Jesus had something else to say. He said, because you've seen me, you believed. But blessed are those who are going to believe in me without seeing. Who are going to take me at my word. Who are going to come to know me in reality because of their trust in me. Have you been there where Thomas was? Anybody? Huh. I'm here to let you know that like Thomas, all your doubt can disappear if you trust him. You know what? You can't stay on the fence forever, folks. I mean, doubt is not a sin, but doubt, doubt turns into unbelief if you, if, you, if you water it long enough and harbor it long enough and take care of it long enough. If you take care of, doubt, care of your doubts long enough, it'll turn to unbelief. And unbelief's a sin. So we have to make a choice. Do we follow Jesus? Do we say, my Lord and my God? Or do we continue in our doubt and our fear until it turns to unbelief and then we're lost? moving away from God instead of toward Him. I love the songs we sang this morning. This is amazing grace. Grace pulls us toward the Lord. You can't remain neutral forever when the pull of God is coming for you. It's a great day. This is Resurrection Day. It's a great day to stop doubting and start believing. Hallelujah.